Brown Building. He's beside Mark Leeson and Ravi, so familiar with most of you, I guess. But he's going to be talking about his work on pathogenic bacteria and um, communication with plants. Thank you so much for having me here and your kind of question. You guys probably have seen me at like the building already. I've been like going up uh, like for, for very often, like us powering your strand and everything. So <laughs> I would like to start with really like acknowledging you guys for so sharing and supportive during the past uh, few months. Yeah, it's been a really wonderful experience starting your own group with uh, so much support, not even from your own department. I mean, another department is not supportive. So. <laughs> Yeah, so today I would like to talk about my work that I studied during my postdoc. So uh, the title here is the pathogen Pathogenic Bacteria Manipulate Plant Cell to Cell Communication. My background was in plant molecular biology and plant cell biology, so I was really interested in studying like, how plant responds to different larvae stress and devalue stress. So I have to say I spent quite several years trying to avoid studying plant microbe interaction because studying plant alone, alone is quite challenging. But if you have to put in another uh, living uh, another organism, it makes things just more complicated. But it's getting more and more evident that if you want to study the biology, you can't avoid almost uh, the impact from those microorganisms. So this slide I stole uh, this slide from uh, Denford Plant Science Center showing that. Of this tiny, but we're always surrounded by this tiny microbe. And uh, these microbes are first uh, first uh, appear uh, on this planet like 3.5 billion years ago, and we're around like 3 billion later, other cellular organisms uh, arose. So all of my cellular organism has been cohabiting and uh, co evolving with these microorganisms throughout the year. And also, we have more information started to show that these microorganisms should shape a whole different aspect of life on this planet, and they are essential part of our life. They, they help protect our host and prevent disease for not only for plant hosts and also also different uh, animal systems. But some, a few of the microorganisms have become pathogenic microbes, and they become really problematic. Like for example, in like plant, if a small or, or a part of a crop field got infected. We could have a hundred percent crop loss in that particular uh, field site, and uh, overall, uh, annually there are around ten to fifteen percent crop loss just uh, due to these plant diseases. So it is also important to study how those pathogenic microorganisms manipulate plant cellular processes to cause disease. And in a way, I'm also using these pathogenic microorganisms to study plant biology. So. To study the inter interaction between plant and microbe, the, the very obvious model or pathogen that I use uh, is uh, Sumerus mini pathophytes in 2000. And this pathogen was initially identified from uh, tomato, and they can survive on tomato leaf surface. But to become pathogenic, they need to get inside leaf tissue. So to get there, these, uh, uh, these bacteria, they get, uh, gain access from the stomata and get into apoplot colonize and spread and cause disease within our uh, plant tissue. So if you look at the tomato infected leaf, you will see this kind of disease uh, symptom showing the halo spot and stuff. In addition to infecting uh, tomato uh, leaves, Romulus syringae disease adults and can also infect uh, proboscis. So for uh, several obvious reasons, this is the model system we chose for material and, uh, and uh, plant model system. So I don't think I need to introduce a whole lot about this uh, host microbe disease susceptibility, but I would like to just take uh, one or two minutes to go through the basic here and uh, focus on uh, this aspect that I'm interested in. So as I mentioned uh, earlier, for a bacteria pathogen to to infect plant, they need to get into leaf tissue. But after they get inside the leaf tissue, they don't get into plant cells. Instead, they live in the apple plant. And the presence of the bacteria will be recognized by the pattern recognition receptor, membrane bound receptor on the plant's surface. And that will initiate a cascade of innate immune responses. So if plant cell can successfully mount innate immunity, then they will stop the bacteria from uh, growing, uh, um, uh, proliferate within the tissue. But pathogenic bacteria like uh, DC-3000 can develop type 3 secretion system. It's a syringe-like structure. So the purpose for this structure is to inject a protein effector uh, from a bacteria into plant cell. And these, uh, uh, several uh, of these uh, protein effector has been known to involve in suppressing plant immune responses. So if 
uh, pathogenic bacteria can suppress plant immunity, then they can overcome the bacteria, uh, they, they can uh, successfully colonize and cause disease within plant tissue. And these protein effector are crucial for pathogenesis because if you block the secretion of this effector protein into plant cell, just by mutating one of the protein on, uh, on this, uh, for, in forming the syringe structure, you can, uh, uh, and uh, the mutant can no longer infect plant disease. So suggesting that these protein effector are crucial for pathogenesis. And when I studied my uh, project in Shenyang He Lab at Michigan State University, I was interested in studying what these different protein effectors are doing in plant cell. What cellular processes they are targeting within plant cell to, to promote disease. So to do that, I started with uh, asking where uh, these different effector proteins localize within plant cell. And so the one syringe inject 32 effector protein. So I started with uh, uh, cloning most of 32, RO, uh, 32 of them and tag with the YP fluorescence molecule. And after the transient, he expressed them in tobacco just to screen for, look for the subcellular localization pattern. So here, this image showed that, uh, uh, showed six particular examples. So here, half Y, half T, these are all different effector molecules that injected by this V1000. Just by looking at this uh, fluorescence, uh, fluorescence signal pattern, you can see they, look, they all look so very different. For example, white white is you can see the signal in the nucleus and also the cytosol, so nicely showing the pathway shaped plant cell. And for half T1-1, show this kind of nice pointed signal. And half B1 is targeted to the endoplasmic reticulum, and half D1 is localized to chloroplast plant cell. And as for half AF1, show really nice platform membrane localization signal. And among these all 32, I found one particular effective protein interesting because of uh, uh, because not only the, the, the green signal can localize to plasma membrane, they also localize to this kind of pumping signal in between two layers of plasma membrane. So to me, this suggests that HAPO1 might be targeted to plasma desmata in plant. So it's just really brief introduction about uh, what is plasma desmata. So plasma desmata are membrane like channels, and they connect between plant cells for cell cell communication. So this membrane line channel will allow the movement of signaling molecules like protein DNA, DNA and even like chromosome across different cells. So they play an important role in maintaining cellular homeo uh, homeostasis in multicellular organisms like plants. And if you look under a uh, microscope using confocal microscopy, you will see this. Uh, you will see the, if you have the uh, YP labor uh, plasmid marker, marker, you will see this kind of pattern. The red line here outline the shape of plant cell. Should probably kill a few lights. Better? Yeah. yeah so the red line is, uh, outline the uh, cell shape and the green signal here show the localization and distribution of plasma mana on a dosis antinervous cell. And these plasma membrane, even though they are membrane line channel, they are not just open hole for all the molecule to move across between cells. So these channels are tightly regulated. So if the plasma mana is open, then this signaling molecule will be able to move from one cell to the neighboring cell. And these uh, plant can uh, respond to the internal or external, external stimuli to regulate the PD aperture in the, the plasma mana function. One of the main mechanisms to control the uh, PD aperture is by depositing candles at the plasma mana neck region within the cell wall so that it close up the PD aperture so that no signaling molecule can move from one cell to the neighboring cell. So before getting into too excited about PD localization, I need to first start with confirming the localization in the plant system that I'm going to study. So I make a transgenic plant expressing a HAPO1-1 YLP molecule again. <coughs> And after that, stain the uh, transgenic plant a leaf with the aniline glue. So the dye can specifically let the stain callus deposited uh, at the plasma smata. So again, the first one here shows that the green signal here, showing the nice plasma membrane, uh, plasma membrane like signal, and also shows this kind of pumpkin spot. And this pumpkin spot colloquies nicely with the marker callus stain, uh, uh, plasma smart aniline glue stain callus. So the, here the merge image showing that they are co-localized nicely. So this suggests that HAPO1-1 indeed is localized to plasma matter in our dosis. So in addition with plasma membrane, so for that, stain the uh, transgenic plant leaf with FN464 to look at when, to look at the co-localization between the two. So this, the two together uh, suggest that uh, HAPO1-1 is localized to both plasma membrane 
than the plus meters data. The reason I was really interested in, uh, start in looking at the plus meters model localized protein is because when we look at the plant microbe interaction or host microbe interaction, we always use this simple model system to explain the interaction between the two organisms. So we we'll always have the pathogen and this one plant cell as a major battleground between the two. But uh, as a plant are multicellular organism, and this neighboring plant cell might also be doing something to defend against the pathogenic microbe. And given that uh, HAP01-1 material effector protein localized to the cell cell to cell communication channel, to me it suggests that bacteria might have already evolved ways to manipulate plant cell to cell communication. So that they're not only manipulating plant immunity here, they might also have a way to manipulate uh, plant immune responses at the surrounding adjacent plant cell. To study uh, into dig a little deeper into that aspect, I started with asking whether uh, HAPO1-1 manipulates the function of uh, plasma smarta in plant. So to do that, I make another transgenic plant overexpressing uh, only HAPO1-1 without any, any tech, and uh, make a stable line in Erdopsis, uh, Erdopsis background. So here, white type Columbia showing the regular plant phenotype, and compared to that, overexpression of HAPO1-1 is a bit smaller plant compared to the, uh, the wild type, suggesting Overexpression of a uh, uh, bacterial uh, protein does have some effect on plant growth and development. And using this material, the main question I would like to ask is whether expression of HAPO1-1 affect plasma smile dependent movement or not. So to study that, I used a method called microparticle bombardment assay. So the idea is that you use uh, uh, this uh, <coughs> a system to ex uh, transiently express uh, two different fluorescence molecules. So the first one is a YP molecule, and the second one is an ER trap CFP. So coat these two plasmids on the gold particle and bombard them into a Dalsy's wild type and training a plant leaf. And after 24 hours after the bombardment, I could use a couple of co microscopy to monitor the uh, expression of uh, the fusion protein. So the idea here is that uh, the ER CFP uh, cannot move from the bombardment cell to the neighboring cell because they are trapped within the ER, within the endoplasmic reticulum. So we can use this to locate where the uh, this gold particle has gold particle has been bombarded. And as for the free YP molecule, it can move from the bombardment cell to the neighboring cell throughout plasma smarta. So by using that, we are able to quantify make a comparison between the Y type and the overexpressor to see whether the expression of HAPO1-1 affect PD dependent movement. So this is the Azure uh, confocal image showing the expression of YFP and after the bombardment. So the brightest signal here at the center show the merged image between CFP, ERCFP and the YFP molecule. And you can see this YFP molecule move beyond the bombardment site to the surrounding uh, plant cells. Compared to Columbia background, if you look at the overexpressor, you can clearly see a lot more neighboring plant cells show up a uh, YFP signal. There. So this suggests that expression of HAPO1-1 does promote, does promote a PD-dependent movement of YP molecule. And quantitatively, when you compare the uh, Y type and HAPO1 expressor, you can see there are a lot more of a uh, neighboring plant cell with YP uh, signaling, YP signal compared to the Columbia. So this suggests that uh, expression of HAPO1-1 indeed change a uh, PD-dependent molecular flux. You know, it just promotes the, the movement of a YP molecule in the transgenic one. <coughs> so after looking at the localization and the, uh, the effect of a HAPO1-1 on the plant, I went back uh, and looked at whether bacteria effector protein, whether HAPO1-1 is important for bacterial virulence or not. So to study that, we can uh, I deleted uh, HAPO1-1 from a uh, DCV thousand background, and after that, in fact, uh, the deletion strain to back uh, to uh, Columbia, uh, Columbia Dobbs's uh, background. So comparing DCV thousand, the white type strain, and the HAPO deletion strain, what you can see, this probably is not clear. What you can see is that this one is uh, uh, in terms of disease symptom, this one looks a lot less. But what uh, you can uh, look at the bacteria count just to see how much bacteria can propagate uh, in, in Columbia uh, white type background, comparing the two different material strains, one white type and one uh, half deletion strain. 
So in terms of bacteria count, what you can see here is that the deletion of HAPO1-1 show around tenfold decrease in bacterial population. Since HAPO1-1 is localized to uh, plasma smarta and it affects uh, PD-dependent uh, movement uh, within plant cell, so I, uh, uh, look in, I started to look into whether HAPO1-1 is important for bacteria to spread from the initial infection site to the neighboring tissue. But with the previous, uh, the standard infection method, we either infect the whole plant or the whole leaf. So in a way, we already help bacteria to overcome that initial uh, infection uh, step. So to study that, I developed a, a different, I used a different infection method to study whether HAPO1-1 play an important role for bacteria to spread from initial infection site to the neighboring uh, tissue. So here, instead of infecting the whole leaf, I'm infecting a tomato leaf here and using the uh, fine needle to locally inoculate uh, bacteria on the leaf surface. And wait for wait, uh, wait for one leaf and see uh, the disease symptom on, on the tomato leaf. So for tomato, you can see again this kind of really nice uh, halo spot showing up uh, uh, a week after the infection. And compared to uh, the wild type strain, the lesion of HAPO1-1. If you look at the, this infected area, they show much smaller disease symptom compared to the wild type. And I also quantify how much bacteria I could recover from this surrounding tissue and here what you can see is uh, again compared to uh, the white type strain, deletion of HAPO1-1 show almost 54 to 104 decrease in bacterial population. So it suggests that HAPO1-1 play an uh, important role for uh, bacteria to spread from the initial infection site to the surrounding tissue. So after uh, establishing uh, the uh, important role of HAPO1-1 in pathogenesis. The next I achieved after the molecular mechanism of HAPO1-1 and start with trying to identify what uh, host uh, protein has been targeted by HAPO1-1. So what I was looking, uh, what I was uh, trying to figure out what, uh, what uh, plant protein might be targeted by HAPO1-1 and I found a paper published from uh, Jomian Lee lab at the University of Delaware. What they found is that one bacteria, pathogenic bacteria in fact plant cell, when we induce expression of uh, plasma smala located protein 5, PDLP5. PDLP5 is a type 1 membrane receptor like protein, and PDLP5 would uh, target specifically to the plasma smata and upregulation of PDLP5 involving closing of the PD channel. And uh, given that uh, HAPO1 1 can target to PD and it facilitates the PD dependent movement, I, it's, uh, I hypothesize that HAPO1 1 coming later and by target PDLP protein to reopen the PD, to reopen the PD aperture. So to test whether a PDLP5 is the target of HAPO1-1, I started with uh, looking at the protein-protein interaction between HAPO1-1 and PDLP proteins. And PDLP5, and PDLP5 belong to a family of eight member, PDLP1 to eight. So instead of uh, only looking at PDLP5, I was, I was also interested in the other PDLP member. And uh, several of these members have been shown to be involved in plant immunity. As I mentioned, PDLP5 was identified to be involved in bacterial immunity. And PDLP1, 2, and 3 has been uh, shown to be involved in viral immunity and uh, fungal immunity as well. So looks like these different PDLP members have a specific role in defense against different microorganisms. So using the co-immunoprecipitation method, I was able to identify a few interacting proteins. So here, if you, if you can see any positive signal band here show up, meaning that this particular PDLP protein can pull down HAPO1-1, suggesting that they are physically interacting. So I was quite surprised, uh, quite excited to see that PDLP5 indeed can interact with the HAPO1-1. And from here, surprisingly, previously uncharacterized PDLP protein, PDLP7, is a much stronger interactor of the HAPO1. See whether PDLP7 also involved in plant immunity, and uh, they, do, they do also have, have a role in bacterial immune responses. So that is using the uh, co-IP approach, and the next I also use a different method to just to confirm the interaction in, v, in, in plant time. So this, for the second method, I chose a molecular fluorescence complementation. So the idea is that 
uh, fluorescence protein, if you have a full length of, for example, YP fusion protein, you could uh, excite the, you could excite the uh, protein and uh, see the emission signal. If you split the two prote uh, protein into N terminal half and C terminal half, and this the two split fusion protein can no longer emit light. And you can fuse your protein of interest, protein A and protein B, to these uh, split fluorescence molecule. And if these two protein A and B, if they're close, physically close enough, and they could uh, complement the uh, fluorescent signal. So using this method, uh, if I only have a half O1-1 with an empty vector, nothing there, like mean that, meaning that there's no fluorescent signal to be detected, and there's no interaction there. And if I have a half O1-1 with PDLP5 together, then I can uh, start uh, detecting the uh, fluorescent signal. From a uh, co-IP data, uh, PDLP5 and PDLP7 are specific interactor. PDLP5 and 7 are specific interactor of HAPO1-1. And even though PDLP6 is a close homolog of, of HAPO1-1, PDLP6 does not interact with, uh, with HAPO1-1 using CoIP. So again, with the BIFC, if I uh, co express uh, HAPO1-1 and PDLP6, no uh, complementation. And if I have HAPO1-1 in PDLP7, again, I could uh, see the uh, expression of uh, fluorescence protein there. So together, this with uh, CoIP data suggests that HAPO1-1 interact with, specifically interact with PDLP5 and PDLP7 in Plato. So after confront, uh, look, uh, confirming the physical interaction, next I look at whether uh, HAPO1-1 affect PDLP protein abundance in plant. As I mentioned uh, earlier, when a uh, plant uh, recognized the bacteria uh, infection, it would uh, upregulate expression of PDLP5. And HAPO1-1 comes in, and if HAPO1-1 need to reopen the PD aperture, then there's a very good chance that they might target uh, the, uh, the protein that involved in closing up the PD channel. So to look at the protein abundance in PDLP protein abundance, uh, abundance in plant uh, in Columbia background or in uh, HAPO training in uh, plant background, I made a few uh, different, several uh, training in line here. So this is PDLP, uh, PDLP5 YFP in Columbia background. So you can see green signal outlining the uh, plant, uh, plant uh, epidermal cell, and you can also see this kind of strong part, spot localizing to the plasma, uh, to the plasma smarter. And compared to Columbia background, in overexpressed line, if you only look at the signal intensity, they look much dimmer here. And if you compare the signal intensity between PDLP6 uh, in Columbia and in Hubble overexpressed over background, they look pretty comparable. And as for PDLP7, overexpression of Hubble one almost there's no detectable PDLP7 uh, signal anymore. So suggesting that HAPO1-1 uh, might destabilize PDLP5 and PDLP7. But this is confocal image, only one snapshot. So I always use a different method to get more like quantitative uh, data seeing whether expression of HAPO1-1 destabilize PDLP5 and PDLP7. So the Western blot data here is showing that here, minus mean in Columbia background, plus mean in a HAPO overexpressive background. So as for PDLP5, <laughs> You can clearly see expression of HAPO1-1 show much reduced PDLP5 signal. And for PDLP6, again comparing the one with with or without a HAPO1-1, not much, uh, there's no uh, drastic uh, different like PDLP5. And again for PDLP7, there's almost no detectable PDLP7 protein in HAPO over expressive background. And I also look into whether this is specific to protein level or whether uh, overexpression of HAPO1-1 affect uh, transcript level of PDLP5 system 7. So using the RT-PCR, what you can see is that here with, without, with, without HAPO1-1 and comparing PDLP7, 6, and 5, there's no major difference in terms of transcript level uh, in uh, two different backgrounds, in Columbia background and in HAPO overexpressive over background. So suggesting that a HAPO1-1 affect PDLP protein abundance. Since most of the protein are degraded, since proteasome dependent pathway is one of the major pathways in degrading the, uh, the uh, protein in the degraded proteins in plant cells, so I also look at whether uh, PDLP are degraded throughout uh, a proteasome dependent pathway or not. 
So to do that, I use a chemical treatment using MG132, which could inhibit proteasome function. To study whether PDLP are degraded throughout a proteasome dependent pathway. So this is a busy slide, and I would like to first uh, uh, draw your attention to the first red box here. So for PDLP5, as I mentioned earlier, in Columbia background and in HAPO overexpressive background, you will see HAPO over expression of HAPO destabilize PDLP5. You will see much weaker signal here. And comparing this one and this one, you can see by putting an uh, inhibitor MG132, you could uh, you could recover the, uh, this protein from being, being degraded there. So suggesting that by using the inhibitor, you could block the PDLP from being degraded. And the same is true for PDLP7. So here, comparing Columbia background and HAPO background, almost non-detectable. By adding the inhibitor MG132, you could partially rescue the uh, PDLP7 expression level in in the transgenic background. So this suggests that PDLP protein are degraded throughout a proteasome dependent dependent pathway. And there's no major difference for PDLP6. Then after uh, collecting this data, the very next uh, big question I would like to answer is how HAPO1-1 manipulate uh, the target protein? So based on the sequence homology, amino acid sequence homology, it is HAPO1-1 is predicted, predicted to be ADP ribose transferase. So that's a type of enzyme that could post translationally modify the target protein by using beta and AD plus as a substrate and it can uh, conjugate the ribosic group to the target protein at the, amin at the site of uh, amino acid arginine. So, and this type of modification has been shown to involve in protein degradation. And also, the uh, HAPO1-1 also has a conserved uh, catalytic domain compared to other different uh, active uh, enzymes. So by mutating, uh, introducing uh, the mutation site there, uh, if the enzyme is active, then theoretically you could abolish the enzyme activity of this uh, protein. So to test whether HAPO1-1 is an active enzyme, uh, active uh, ribosic transferase, I uh, express uh, these different HAPO1 and uh, different, different, different effector protein in E. coli and purify that. So as I mentioned earlier, I have a HAPO1-1 wild type and catalytic mutant HAPO1-1 DD here. And hub u one is another uh, bacteria effector protein got injected by, um, also by D3000, and it has previously shown to be an active ribosy transferase. So that protein here is used as a positive control and also the catalytic mutant as a negative control there. Using the in vitro ribosylation uh, assay, I could nicely reproduce that hub u one is a really active enzyme. And compared to uh, all the other negative control, I could see a nice bump for HAPO1-1 and show much higher specific activity compared to the rest. So this suggests that HAPO1-1 might have the, uh, might be an active uh, ADP ribosy transferase. In addition to the in vitro uh, data, I want to look at the uh, transgenic plan. Uh, Initial, uh, if, if I have a HAPO overexpressed, the white type HAPO overexpressed in the plant, the plant looks smaller. But when I overexpress uh, HAPO 1 and catalytic mutant, they look just like white type. So this suggests that catalytic, mutant, catalytic activity of HAPO 1 1 is required, at least to affect plant growth and development. Since overexpression of HAPO 1 1 affect PD dependent movement, I also, look in, I also look at whether overexpression of HAPO1-1 catalytic mutant would also affect the PD-dependent uh, movement or not. And what you can see here is that if you compare it uh, with different lines, the catalytic mutant looks just like Columbia background. So this suggests that in order to affect PD-dependent movement, you need the catalytic activity of HAPO1-1. In addition, uh, uh, this one's, uh, there's a segment of uh, transmembrane domain and only a small fragment of C2 uh, uh, tail is exposing in the cytosol and this will be the, uh, the only region that uh, bacterial effector protein HAPO1-1 can have access to and if there's any modification going on, it should be within this region. So this suggests that if HAPO1-1 can modify, then likely it will modify any amino acid around this area. And when I look at the amino acid sequence at this C-terminal tail, only this region, 
And I found that for PDLP5, 6, and 7, there are at least one uh, arginine site that could be the, uh, the, uh, the modification site for HAPO1-1. So I would like to know whether uh, I could, uh, whether by mutating these two uh, arginine, whether this, um, the, 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 the mutant protein become resistant to HAPO1-1 dependent uh, protein degradation. To do that, I make a transgenic plant expressing uh, PDLP mutating these two amino acids. So I show you this before already. If there is uh, in Columbia background PDLP highly expressed, but if there is a HAPO1 dashing expressed, no detectable signal there. And as for PDLP7 uh, with the arginine mutation at the C terminal till, the mutant can no longer uh, be degraded by HAPO1 1. <laughs> So all these different data points are uh, uh, suggesting that PDLP is the target of HAPO1-1 and PDLP might be ribosylating, ribosylating PDLP5 and PDLP7 to degrade the two protein. But at this point, I'm still trying very hard to really show the, the actual modification on, on PDLP7 uh, and also, uh, also Confront that indeed uh, HAPO1 1 can have uh, ADP ribosyl transfer receptivity in plant time. So, with that, this is the working hypothesis for this project. The current hypothesis is uh, one bacteria is coming in, they can inject different effector protein, and different effector protein can do different things. And uh, in the case of HAPO1 1, it targets to, to uh, Plasma Smarter and it degrade PDL, uh, interact with PDLP5 and 7 and uh, degrade PDLP7 so that they can reopen the PD aperture. By reopening the PD aperture, uh, HAPO1-1 might uh, be able to facilitate the movement of other different infected protein injected into the this plant cell and facilitating them to move from the infected cell to the neighboring plant cell. So that bacteria can not only manipulate plant immunity here, but also manipulate plant immunity at the surrounding adjacent plant cell. So that bacteria can, uh, can successfully colonize at the initial infection site and spread beyond the initial infection site. So this is pretty much what I, I, I've done in in uh, Shenyang P lab. So I would like to take a few, a few slides, use a few slides to talk about a few different uh, research programs that we're developing in my current lab. So I'm continue carrying on, on this particular line of research and recently we're trying to trying to look at whether uh, HAPO1-1 and also PDLP5 and 7 involved in, maintain, in regulating plasma smart aperture. So we're doing a lot of uh, TNSA to look at the outer structure of plasma smart And also we are trying to, uh, uh, to look at whether uh, effector protein can move, uh, HAPO1-1 can facilitate the movement of effector protein from this infected cell to the neighboring plant cell. And for the second, uh, another research program, we're trying to identify novel components that involve in callus deposition at the plasma smart as I mentioned earlier, calloids is the main mechanism in con controlling the PD function and PD aperture. So if you have, if uh, there are a lot if there are a lot of uh, calloids deposited at the PD neck region and the chain are going to be much tighter, so that not, no not much uh, communication communication would happen between plant cells. And currently, there's not much known about what regulate. Uh, the whole uh, callus homeostasis, but we do have a few key information showing that callus synthase is involved in, in depositing callus at the PD neck region. And there's a group of enzymes called beta 13 glucanase they are involved in degrading callus there. And beyond that, we don't have much information what might be a uh, differential, uh, what, what uh, component might be involved in dynamically regulating the callus uh, biosynthesis, cal callus uh, synthesis and callus degradation. So that's one of the main uh, uh, areas that uh, we would like to move forward uh, in the future. And for the first uh, small project, we're trying to uh, characterize the functional role of uh, UD, uh, UGT1. It is a UDP glucose transferase. So from the current knowledge, if we piece together, we're trying to see whether there will be a callus in this complex sitting on the plasma membrane closer to the plasma smarta so that the whole complex can quickly deposit calories at the, uh, at the plasma smarta upon uh, microbial infection. 
And what we know is that uh, sucrose synthase 1 catalyzes uh, uh, the formation of UDPG, and catalyst synthase uses UDPG as a substrate to build catalogs. And UGT1 uh, uh, is involved in uh, transferring the UDPG to, to catalyst synthase, and it has been established that UGT1 physically interact with catalyst synthase. So to me, it makes a lot more sense that there is a uh, catalyst synthase, uh, uh, the whole complex sitting either on the plasma membrane or close to the plasma asthma, so that it can respond to different stimuli and uh, quickly deposit catalyst at the plasma asthma. And also, uh, interestingly, expression of UGT1 is differentially regulated by uh, T3000 infection. So we're trying to figure out whether UGT1, the whole complex, uh, either is there or would be uh, quickly assembled upon microbial infection. It's, uh, based on this one, you would, you would notice that we don't know much about what regulates Kellogg's stabilization and uh, Kellogg's homeostasis at the plasma smarter. So currently, we are also uh, screening a uh, DQI library. So that's a UBOX, FBOX, and UBOX DQI library. The library is uh, built by uh, Josh General Lab at Yale University. So the idea here is that we know FBAS and UBAS protein involved in degrading the target protein. By uh, the FBAS protein, this domain is responsible for interacting with the ubiquitin protein complex, and the, uh, the other domain on the FBAS or UBAS specifically interact with their specific target. So meaning that if you have the whole thing that the FBAS protein facilitate to degrade any target protein. And the DQI library, they remove this FBOX or UBOX protein so that the DQI can now only interact with the target, but they no longer uh, be, being a part of the complex anymore. So if you overexpress this one, then the DQI can, not, can no longer degrade the target. So meaning that if, if in that case, if any of these target proteins are positively or negatively involved in Kellogg's deposition process, then we should be able to see something by overexpressing this. So currently we are uh, overexpressing this DQI uh, library individually into tobacco plant and look for, specifically screen for Kellogg's over accumulator. Yeah, so, uh, so far we have around uh, 1020 uh, candidates that we're chasing after to see any of these FBOX or UBOX protein might be a positive or, or negative regulator of Kellogg's synthase or a better one, three glucanates. So ideally, if the FBOX, FBOX, if we found the regulator of calosynthase complex, then the FBOX or UBOX, the DQI, could ne negatively regulate the calosynthase complex. And for the uh, beta 1, 3 glucanase, we are looking for the opposite uh, relationship, like the FBOX or UBOX might, might be a positive regulator of uh, beta 1, 3 glucanase directly or indirectly. And as I mentioned uh, earlier, PDLP play an important role in plant immune responses and also involved in, in callus deposition. So we also would like to know what PDLP proteins are doing. At this point, we only know that these proteins play an important role in regulating PD function and also regulate callus deposition. So we are also trying to, trying to uh, uh, dig deeper into studying the, the function of PDLP in plant time. And another line of research uh, we're developing at this point is to study cell autonomous and non-cell autonomous immune responses using a brand, a, a new uh, pathway system that I've never worked with. So for this, uh, we're using RISE and Metropolitan RISE pathway system. So one of the, one, a few, there are a few reasons that uh, I'm really excited about using this pathway system is because unlike bacteria, uh, upper, or even uh, signaling like a calcium sensor or different hormone, hormone sensor kind of thing, so that we could uh, simultaneously look at the cellular responses for three different uh, marker, marker protein or three different cellular dynamics in the infected cell and also the surrounding cell. And one, another big reason I would like to, uh, to develop this system is because uh, similar to uh, bacteria infection, uh, this, uh, this fungi also secrete effector protein into the infected right cell. And this effector protein, even before this invasive hyper actually spread to the neighboring cell, this effector protein can be translocated to the neighboring several black cell. So to me, it showed the very similar thing that uh, I found with, uh, uh, I'm uh, hypothesizing with uh, bacteria uh, pathogen is that 
right before these uh, pathogen actually reach the neighboring, uh, neighboring plant cell, they send out this uh, effector protein to the surrounding cell so that they could suppress plant immunity, not only here, but also the surrounding cell for them to successfully uh, spread and spread into those cells later. In addition, this invasive hyper, after they fully occupy this, they pen penetrate to the neighboring cell, again, through our plasma smarta. So meaning that uh, this fungal pathogen need to have a, a sophisticated way to manipulate the plasmus mara for different effector protein to move and for the invasive hyper to physically pen penetrate and get to the neighboring, neighboring uh, rice cell. So we are also investing quite a lot on this project at this point, but it's, it's at the very beginning stage, uh, just stay trying to try to learn whether we could actually in fact, a rise with uh, the fungal pathogen in our lab. So, yeah, with that, I would like to acknowledge a few people here and start with my group here. It's kind of weird to say that. <laughs> within, the, the, within the past uh, uh, eight months, I have uh, recruited quite a few people. So, I now have three postdocs in the lab and one graduate student uh, just joined the lab uh, a few weeks ago and I already have an army of undergraduate students helping me with uh, doing a lot of things in the lab and I would like to thank Shenyang Hee for being super supportive yeah, he's a super nice, a generous uh, PI and the project uh, for the Hub one that you have project we're collab collaborating with uh, Jim Papano and I've been bugging quite a few people in technology and in particular I would like to thank uh, Justin and Steve for the help, and I'm pretty sure I'll be coming back to more of you guys in the future too. Hopefully we could have more collaboration and I could be a contributing member in this community. Yeah, I kind of feel like I've been like begging everyone and getting all the good stuff, so hopefully I can start giving back something. So, yeah, and also would like to acknowledge the funding source of a uh, startup from LAS and also Career Award, Azir Zero Award from NIH. So with that, I would be happy to take any of your questions. Okay, stop here. Yes? I was just curious, uh, when you show this two common case for the top and the DLPs, so it looks like uh, the DLP5 has a weak interaction Yes. And then when you show PIT, it looks like both of them. I was wondering if you checked, like, many other cells. Yeah. Do, do they look the same like the twins, or because it's kind of... Uh -huh. uh, good point, right? Yeah. Cell biology, most cell biologists would, would catch that. <laughs> My explanation is because of the interaction. So the inter interaction between uh, HAPO1-1 and PDLP is stronger in... Uh, in uh, Interaction between uh, PDL P5 and HAP01 1 is weaker, and the interaction, I believe, the, uh, based on the data, interaction facilitates the degradation. So, there is a reason why when you have a HAP0 co expressed with PDL P7, you are seeing weaker signal. Make sense? <laughs> yes. I have a few questions. The yep. first half of your talk looked like a plant virology talk <laughs> on movement. Um, so have you tried to complement it with any plant virus and movement proteins, the HAPO one? Not yet. But I've been working on, I'm currently using, on um, uh, trying to test, uh, look at where the virus can move faster. So I have to yeah, look at the other way around them. too. Yeah, yeah, are these plants more susceptible to? I have not tested. Oh. Yeah, so I've been like bugging uh, Steve uh, quite several times already just to have the uh, virus infection system. Okay. So I'm now uh, try, uh, gonna try the uh, GFP labor strain so that I could easily quantify okay. the virus movement comparing uh, HAPO overexpress the background and also uh, looking at PDLP mutant. And then, I mean, generally I think it's all with plant virus cell to cell movement. It's not just simply a bigger opening, mm -hmm. but there are interactions between the movement proteins and various yep. host proteins that are pro-viral, that help yep. the movement. Mm -hmm. And it looks to me more like you're just talking about trying to block mm -hmm. these PDLPs that yep. close things up. Uh -huh. So, I don't know, are you going to do like a yeast 2 hybrid screen and do a, look for more interactors? It looks like here you kind of just guessed and uh -huh. you know, 
lucky that one. You're right. Whatever yeah. you guessed that in right. Yeah. I've tried to, uh, I haven't tried full on SEO. We did try to extrapolate one time, but I, we didn't finish the screen. So this is the memory protein, so we have to use yeah, a different yeah, memory yeah. system. And I did try to uh, do a YP. So I'm still thinking about trying at least one more round to identify whether I could pull down half or intelligent protein using a YP approach. Yeah. yeah okay. So could like yeah. uh, these two hybrid could be could be could be great to try one more time as well. Yep. Sorry to ask some questions here. <laughs> and then also for the like BIFC, uh, how does that work when most of you, you've got this fusion of the half of a YFP to the PDLP protein, yeah. uh -huh. but most of that protein is the other side of the membrane. Uh -huh. The fusion is at the center. Okay, so it's going to be in the cytoplasm. Yeah. Okay. So for a PDLP5, most of the type 1 membrane protein, you have to fuse YP at the A terminal. But for some reason, for all PDLP, you have to fuse it at the C terminal to get to the PD localization. Yeah. So that seems yeah. to be the functional one. So they are within yeah. the same yeah. compartment. Okay. Yeah. Steve? Um. Think there's a subset of effectors that might be trafficked, or is any any effector that's a type three effector is it likely to be trafficked? If there is a subset of the effector, I don't I don't know what would be the the uh, the correct answer. But if I can pick, I will pick the one that was uh, the primary effector that involved in suppressing plant immunity. So it could be a subset, but it could, it could also largely depend on the size of the invention because the size of the invention quite varies. For example, uh, AVRE could be like uh, uh, 200 or something to But like most of the invention are along like 30 to uh, 50, uh, 30 to uh, 40 kilodalton. So those should be able to move through a plasma smart arm. Yeah. But if I can like kind of uh, guess, then the, the one that we already know, or the one that involved in suppressing plant immunity might be the best group of vector that will move to the neighboring cell before uh, bacteria arrive. Okay, that, that's my follow up. My question is, why do you think that? Why do you think it would be the effect of suppressing defects that, that need to move to the neighboring cell? Uh -huh. If those neighboring cells are infected by another cell of bacteria, those bacteria would in, inject the same suppressor. So yep. uh, it's, it's just a temporal aspect to uh -huh. me that may be the advantage of getting the effector into the neighboring cell. Yep. And it may not be the suppression of defects. Uh -huh. It may be something else. Uh -huh. It may make that cell more yep. uh, conducive to bacterial colonization. Uh -huh. So if you knock out HOP01, yep. then I would think you should see more HR. Uh -huh. But I'm not sure you saw that. No. So, no HR. so if it's really enabling suppression of defense in the neighboring cell, uh -huh. so then I would think in the, in the HOP01 knockout, uh -huh. you would trigger more HR, but you don't but there's no uh, available, at least there's no strong available protein in D3000 that can trigger HR in herbdopsis, okay. so that could be another explanation. And I do agree that like if, bacteria, if there are a lot of bacteria that they can just go around, move around and infect other plant cells, then HAP0 might not play uh, an important role. But the thing that I'm um, interested in is maybe the HAP0, if you only have one or two bacteria get into a leaf of uh, leaf tissue, that if they're gonna need to, like a uh, strong evidence I have at this point is with the tomato weather that I show, when they become short, they show less halo spot. So, but I haven't really like looked into where the bacteria can actually, like, uh, they can migrate more to the uh, neighboring cell in uh, tomato system. But I did have that in herbalcy system, but not in Colombia. It has to be in like one of the immune defect uh, ecotype. So for that, uh, they have to carefully look into whether they really facilitate, like a deletion of hubble web H1 would really block material from moving from on the infected side to the... How conserved are these plasmidismata proteins across these fairly unrelated plant species? Quite, I would say quite conserved. Like, I can easily pick out, like, identify uh, another seven, eight in drives. And I haven't looked into other other plant species, so I would assume PDLP protein are quite conserved. Is the arginine the position of the arginine concerned as well? I have not looked into that. Yeah, yeah 
that's a good point. So in the cartoon you showed with the Magnaforte, you had IPs squeezing through yes. plasma that's modern and then opening up on the other side. Yes. So that's readily apparent? Yes. There's a science paper that just come out last year, they're showing the light, that had a light up. It's also the same, I think the same group, it might, be, it might be the same group of protein involved in penetration, also a step formation, also responsible for the invasive hyper to penetrate through. So they also form that kind of like a constraint. Very small. How big is a plasma of this one? 50 nanometer, around 50 nanometer. So they're pretty tiny. Yeah, like one tenth the size of IP. So I have a question about the non-cell anonymous immune response. Uh -huh. So to how many layers of cells is the immune response non-cell anonymous? How many cells? Layers. How it spreads, like to what extent it's Yeah, I mean, that would be the thing that I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have the answer. I don't think we really know at this point. So that would be another thing that we would like to look into, like, uh, if there is a pathogenic microbe there, how many neighboring cells would differentially respond? And does it trigger a systemic uh, signal? It could be. Yeah. yeah that systemic uh, signal uh, signal could also uh, uh, pass through the PD, uh, the plasma smart uh, to spread uh, systemically. So, in a way, like that, kind of like time, time to get more. Well, I was just thinking about it. I've always thought it was curious that it's like in DC3000 that when they say that some of the effectors interrupt membrane vesicle transport, that bacteria don't go through the cell wall. So having a fatter cell wall right there seems ridiculous. So this actually explains, I mean, if it really was interrupting the callus deposition to a, a plasma desmata, that would make a lot more sense. Any more questions for Dr. Hahn? All right, well, let's thank you.